Welcome to our weekly Friday talk and tour series when we share the opportunity to visit the studios of our wonderful artists and hear about their works and inspiration. These visits are brought to you by the Duncan McClellan Gallery and the DMG School Project of St. Petersburg, Florida. Thank you for joining us. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy Friday. Uh, we're very happy that you're here. I want to thank all of you for attending. Uh, I want to thank my team for being able to pull this together and especially our artists. Um, DMG has been very active uh, this week. Uh, just got back from Kentucky, uh, bringing a lot of equipment to DMG. We're doing a lot of expansion, uh, new filming capabilities. Uh, so uh, keep up with us. You'll see some really great things in the fall. Uh, but we're really excited today to talk to Elodie Holmes and I uh, would like uh, Mary to take it away. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, we have a very special artist today. They're all special, but Elodie is really special to us. She's been a good friend. Uh, Duncan met her in Santa Fe. Danielle and I met her at SOFA Chicago uh, two, well, last year, I guess. That's all, yeah. yeah. And we were so excited to, to uh, discover her work. Um, so we're, we're honored to have you here today, Elodie, and uh, to join us from Santa Fe and to share your life and work. We know that everyone will see some very exciting pieces. You have some very important things to say, and we look forward to hearing them. Uh, you're going to share your, Elodie's going to share her screen now, and she'll start her presentation. If you have any questions, please enter them in the chat, and we will address them to Elodie uh, at the proper, uh, she's going to give a few breaks and we'll address your questions and comments. Thanks for joining us again. Here's Elodie. Hi, thank you so much, Mary. And Duncan, Irene, Danielle, what a great team you guys are. Um, thanks for having me and giving me this great opportunity to tell you a little bit about my life and my artistic trajectory here in Santa Fe. Um, I want to dedicate this talk today uh, to my Dear, dear friend, Jerry Silverstein, uh, who was a very valued member of our glass community here. Uh, he passed away on August 15th, unfortunately, um, due to illness. And uh, he was a true lover of glass and, and the, glass art, uh, the glass arts and glass artists. Um, he was instrumental in bringing a lot of us together uh, in the shows and at our New Mexico Glass Alliance uh, Maestro programs here. Uh, we hosted a lot of demos here at Liquid Like Glass with him. Uh, he was really supportive of me over the years and was looking forward to my talk today. So I hope you're watching, Jerry. I love you and I miss you. Um, let's, uh, this is a picture of the front of my studio here in the, the heart of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my, myself and my family first before I go into the work. Um, I'm from a, a family of creatives, uh, starting with my great-grandfather, Frank Graham Holmes. Uh, he was chief designer of Lenox, China from 1905 to 1954. Uh, he, one of his sons was a painter. His other son, my grandfather, was a musician and did the Lenox trade shows. Uh, and, and then my dad, my dad's brother is a rock musician on the East Coast. Um, and um, this is, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot this picture. <laughs> This is one of the drawings, the renderings that my great grandfather did for, for Lennox, and then they would render it into high quality china. Um, this is a picture of my father's uh, workshop when we were kids. Uh, he was a fluidic engineer and inventor. He had a lot of patents, uh, worked for the government. Some of the rocket shaped forms in the back, uh, he, he used to design parts for the Mercury rockets and Apollo rockets, but he had a love of sailing and, and these little race cars. Uh, we had trains at Christmas. Um, we, we did a lot of sailing and camping and uh, um, he was artistic, uh, would do a lot of drawing. And I used to steal his art supplies all the time um, for myself and he did photography and I spent a lot of time in his dark room. Uh, these are my two of my brothers and I also have two sisters. My little brother, the youngest one there back then is an architect also. 
Um, we grew up sailing. I used to race Hobie Cats as a teenager, and this is me and my dad. I'm on the trapeze. Uh, we were pretty competitive. And this is me at the beach at Cape Hatteras in North Carolina is doing surf fishing. My dad got us each a pole and we used to go and catch our dinner as we had a big family. Um, today I like to uh, fly fish for trout and I tie all of our own flies. It's uh, really gotten me, uh, it's very relaxing for me and I love the, the, the craftiness of tying the flies too. It's, it's really fun for me. Um, I also like to keep bees. Uh, we got beehives on our property, my partner and I, um, to help pollinate our garden. Uh, we have a, a pretty large garden, it's about 3,000 square feet. It's producing quite well right now. We have a very short growing season here in Santa Fe, and we're just getting tons of uh, tomatoes. My partner and spouse, Janine Cabasel, is uh, she was the tomato lady of Santa Fe, and she's also known for growing giant pumpkins. This is her record-breaking, New Mexico record-breaking 448 pound giant pumpkin in our garden in 2011. Um, she's also, uh, she's a professional illustrator and graphic designer. Um, and I taught her how to blow glass and she's a master gardener. So we keep pretty busy in our, our lives. And this is my daughter. Um, she's in her early thirties and she lives in New York. Uh, and she is a, uh, she helps, she runs a magazine, a director of publishing, and she's also a labor solidarity activist and organizer. Uh, between her editing skills and uh, Janine's graphic skills, I have a great in-house team for helping to do things like that for my business. <laughs> um, okay, so moving into my glass trajectory. Uh, I went to California College of Arts and Crafts. Uh, I, I went out there in 1979. I did a lot of ceramics in high school and went to CCA for glass and ceramics. I started with Viola Frey and this is a picture of Marvin Lepofsky on the left and Fritz Dreisbach on the right. Kind of a rare picture of the two of them working together at CCAC. Um, they, uh, oops, they, um, were great mentors for me, uh, Marvin, and a lot of the, the glass, the business of glass and presenting yourself and your work and all of that. And, and Fritz, of course, for technique and, and, and glass blowing. Um, I, te I, I moved to Santa Fe in 81 and to help run a glass shop that used to be on, on Canyon Road. Uh, uh, this is the picture of that shop from all those years ago. Um, Shortly after moving there, a couple of years after moving there in 84, I went to Pilchuck for the first time as a TA for Marvin and Fritz. It was a great experience, met lots of people there. And um, so on the way, on the, the following year in 85, I was on my way back on an artist in residence scholarship. And I fell asleep at the wheel and had a, a near fatal car crash. Um, I, at that time, I didn't know if I'd ever be able to blow glass again. But by the time, five months later, I came back to Santa Fe. I was, you know, hospitalized in Utah for all those months. And a good friend of mine, Wayne Archer, who uh, used to be the glass blower, the scientific glass blower for Los Alamos Laboratories, uh, he suggested that I take up flame work. So I did. And before I started forming my glass business around flame work. And these are some of the sculptures that I, I made during that time. Um, I did a lot of uh, cherubs and figures and goddess figures um, and, and it was really about my love and reverence for life. You know, I was very grateful to be alive uh, as it was uh, a very close call for me back then. And uh, about eight or nine years later, I was invited to blow glass with Peter Vanderlyn in, in one of his shops here in Santa Fe. And right away, I started integrating some of the figurative work I've been doing in, in flame work. And I used to pull my own co colored cane because Peter would melt his own colors. And I would flame work my figures. And here I am picking them off, off of a hot plate. And then I, I melt them in. But first I have to touch down all the little points and make sure everything's flat. Otherwise it kind of melts into a big ball. And then uh, here's another picture of the, of the piece that's been cased with those figures. And then when I put them in a piece that I blow, they actually expand like letters on a balloon. And I have a technique where I use a, a chemical called uh, silver bromide and it creates the halo around the figures and they grow and expand and they become looser and, and more expressive. And, uh, and I pull my own Marinis 
and that kind of helped put me on on the map by uh once i started blowing glass again and within about five years i um i i i, I needed more shop i needed more time at the furnace i was working in two different hot shops a different cold shop and i was uh shipping and invoicing and doing everything at it at my own home studio so finally i i got to liquid light glass i found the building in 2000 on baca street in santa fe and this is a, a shot of my gallery as you walk through the front door um baca street well santa fe is known for all the uh, artists that we have here and we've got like 300 over 300 galleries alone um Baca Street had a lot of the artists living and working here and and I helped to organize them into what we now call the Baca Street Art District. So we're a valid district in Santa Fe where we host uh, annual events and um, and shows and things like that. And it's a pretty vibrant community. Uh, we all work together to do that. Um, and here's a here's a, here's the tour of my shop. Anyway, this is the hot shop part. I originally built my shop to be my private studio, uh, but very soon it became much more than that. With the, the tours we were doing uh, in 2004, I, uh, I'm co-owner of another glass shop in town called Prairie Dog Glass with Patrick Moore, and Marie Elsesser. And uh, it's about a mile and a half down the road from us uh, here at Liquid Light. And then, um, in 2005, I think, uh, the following year, uh, we established the Glass Arts, the Glass Alliance of New Mexico. And that's one of the things that I, I co-founded with Jerry. Uh, I was on the board there, a former board member, and we do lots of activities and we teach classes here. Um, I, this, my garage door opens up to the parking lot and people just walk by. There's a great cafe next door and they wander in and, and watch and, and I can, move a lot of stuff out of the way and have chairs so people can watch some of the demos. And then the, the other part of my shop is the cold shop. This is where we do all the grinding and polishing of the, the work there that we make and uh, mostly my work, I must say. Um, but I use, uh, you know, grinding wheels and, and uh, a little bit of diamond, but um, mostly a, a grits, uh, aluminum oxide and silicon carbide. And we have our belt sanders and our vertical polishers and lots of shelves of, of uh, elements that are in process. Um, here we are approaching uh, where some of my Aurora sculptures are waiting to be finished in one stage or another. Some are just waiting for stands and some are waiting to be finished polishing. Um, I have, uh, you know, these uh, bevels that you see on some of the pieces are done in the, the hot shop, you know, after we've made the, the hot shop, after we've made them in blown glass we cut them open and bring them to a polish in the cold shop. So, so some of my earliest work when I went, when I got my own studio were these uh, timelines and um, the timelines, uh, they kind of represent consciousness and motion. Um, there was a lot of movement. I love the way glass flows. I love the way you can stretch it and pull it and move it and sort of freeze it in, in motion. And, and, it, it, and has this natural flow to it. Um, so these were, and you'll see this element, this twisted vortexy element showing up in my work in different ways uh, uh, through my, my uh, working history. Um, these pieces uh, can be commissioned. I do still make them, uh, and, and, but I don't have any at the very, this very moment. Then I also thought these forms would be fun to blow into and it, because I was inspired by seashells that I would find on the beach when you find a conch shell and the outer shell is broken off and you're left with that little spiral in the middle. I thought, well, the interior is so interesting. I thought I could uh, make some of these elements and put them in a kiln, heat them up and then blow a bubble of other color um, into them. And then uh, again, go into the cold shop and bevel them open. So you can see the undulations and it's just, it, it just, uh, I love the way the glass flows and gets organic. Uh, Elodie, I have a yeah. question. How many people uh, work out of your shop normally? Um, I have about six different people that, that work for me in various capacities. I, I have uh, teachers, uh, 
well, I guess I have like five teachers to help teach the classes so that that frees me up to uh, work on my work. Uh, we're just doing classes that are open to the public. You can come in and make flowers or paperweights or vases or chilies. Um, you have to reserve ahead of time. It's kind of similar to what, what Corning's doing. Um, so it's, it's open to people who have no experience. Uh, we gear it towards, we help a lot. We, we do most of the work, but you get to actually handle the pipe and melt the color in and things like that. And it's become quite a popular event here um, in, yeah. uh, in our little town. And do uh, you do your own cold working as well? Do I do the cold working? Yes. Yes, I do some of the cold working, but I do uh, have a gentleman named Al Leadham who does most of my cold working because again, uh, it frees me up to do all these other things like Duncan, I'm sure you understand. <laughs> a lot of people come in and want to talk to you all the time and um, and I've got a lot of other work to do. So yes, Al is a Certainly very understand. Part. Yeah, a very valuable. I have a great team here. My shop manager has been with me 20 years. She was wow. pregnant with her youngest when she started working for me and her youngest is now a sophomore in college. <laughs> so it's a, uh, we have a really nice community here. And, and it also in terms of glass blowing, um, there's a, we have a great history of glass blowing here in New Mexico and we have a really strong community of, of, of glass art here. And uh, we exchange assistance. If I need some, you know, three or four big guys to help me with some big pieces, I have people I can draw on. Ira Lujan, Spooner Marcus, Patrick Morsi, you know, all these great people that I have access to. So we have a really nice community here. Um, uh, let's see, Eva Klein asks, do you ever make any jewelry? You know, I did a really long time ago, and I, I don't anymore, but I do represent uh, Rupama Schwartz's work in my gallery. I do have we some love Rupama. Okay. Yeah, she, I, I, you know, all the work, I do represent the work of some of the people that work for me too, and let them blow glass in exchange for working here as, as well as paying them, and they sell their work here, and Rupama, moved to Florida, but now she's moving back. So I get, you know, get to say everybody's from Santa Fe again. <laughs> Great, thanks. I know this is an important uh, series for you. So let's hear about this. All right, thanks. So the Aurora uh, series that, that I'm gonna talk about, it's, it really started with my love for this Calcedoni glass, which is an ancient Italian glass formula. Uh, was discovered like in the 1200s, uh, the formula was lost during the plague, then rediscovered, then lost again during the, the wars in the 1700s with Napoleon, and rediscovered again in I think 60s and 70s with the Rosine family from the island of Murano. And this is an example of, of what was happening with it. Um, it's very striated, it looks like stone, and uh, I learned uh, to use this color, um, because there's more to it than just the formula, at, at Peter Vanderlyn's studio, Glory Hill Glass. And when I finally got my own shop, I started being able to play with the formula more myself. And, and this is more of what I have become known for doing with it. Um, I like getting the more vibrant colors. It's really easy to overheat it and, it and it kind of mutes the colors a little bit. You'll still get the striations and it looks kind of landscapey and all of that but I've really strived for the vibrancy of, of the colors. And here you see that, that vortex um, timeline element again in my work. Um, these pieces uh, are spun out off center on the blowpipe and you'll see that in just a second. Um, I get, this is a transparent color on the inside and you can see the, the Calcedoni color coming through it uh, from the other side. That's why you can see those stripes and lines through it. Um, these pieces, I display most of them on a, um, a, a single post there that, so that you can swivel the piece. So the base stays still, but it, it swivels on that single point. So it, it's like having uh, two pieces. The one side looks very different from the other side. And I cut these uh, windows into it. It's just another element of openness and bringing you inside the piece and, and letting your eye flow in and around the whole piece and seeing all the colors. Um, uh, it's just one of my favorite things. Um, it, I've just fallen in love with this color. Uh, this is a piece at Duncan's Gallery. Um, I also spin them out on center and I still like the beveled windows, uh, so I call these discs. Um, and this is Morning Glory. One of the things about the color is uh, it's made um, 
it has five different metals in it. And the formula, the recipe is important. The atmosphere you melt it in is important. And then how much I heat it and cool it while it's on the blowpipe is important. And all three of those things is, are how I, I'm able to achieve these vibrant colors. This is what the piece looks like that you just, that you saw first with, that I spun around, uh, with the light coming through it. It shows all these warm colors. It's showing the, you know, the, the copper and the, and the silver that's in the formula. Um, but then when it has the front light on it, it's more blue. Um, this is a different piece, but it would look very similar to what you just saw. Uh, I believe this one's at Duncan's Gallery too. Uh, so, they, so the nature of, of how I make them kind of flattens them out. Um, I work very closely with a couple of metalsmiths here in town. Um, my, my main guy is Caleb Smith, and he's an extremely talented metal artist and uh, blacksmith. And he showed me one day, I wanted something special for this glass piece, and, and I kept seeing it up and uh, some kind of um, organic lifting, almost figure-like form. And he said, oh, I just discovered this new texture on, these, uh, on this all thread. And he showed me and, and then we made it happen. And he did a lot, a lot of, this took many months to complete because of all that weaving and hammering. But uh, it's one of my favorite pieces. The, the other thing that happens with my formula is I can put it into a, an optic mold which is like a, a cone shape with ribs in the middle. Uh, some of you may have seen people using them in other uh, glass techniques. And what happens is, oops, sorry. Uh, what happens is the, um, when the hot glass, the calcedony touches the cold metal, it will change its color. And so with this piece, I do it three times. I put it in the mold, I twist it so that the um, stripes become, you know, spiraling around the piece, go into the mold again, untwist it. Now the piece looks more like a pine cone, a textured pine cone with high peaks and points. I get it to a very certain temperature and I roll it on the metal table again. And the metal is what cools those little spots and makes it look like uh, peacock eyes. So that, that's how this particular texture is done. Um, and this piece will change color again once I put it into the annealing oven uh, as to slowly cool because some of the colors in it will change at a lower temperature. Uh, this is a piece I have here uh, that's on a bronze stand and I would love to do some more bronze um, stands. Uh, most of them are all steel. This one also swivels, all of these swivel. This one swivels at the small point in the middle. It's about 54 inches tall. And I just love that fire flame with the blue. I just, it's one of my favorite color combinations if you haven't been able to <laughs> tell. But this is an example of how I spin out those forms. Uh, some people think that I actually blow a bubble and then slump it in a kiln later, but really I go for that stretching and pulling. Uh, I get the, the opening off center and, uh, and start spinning and both, both edges of both edges of the opening go one way instead of opening out into a, a flat disc they'll open up in like almost pocket like um, uh, Elodie we have a question from Eric and mm -hmm. he says uh, your newer pieces are much more organic than earlier work with the cherubs etc yeah and could you please talk about that transition um, I think that um, I wanted to um, Sometimes I, I, I have a very specific narrative and you'll see some of that later on in the slideshow. Um, and, but I also, I was so enamored with the color of the Calcedony glass that I wanted to come up with something that would complement it in a more organic way, an abstract way. And, and so that's how I came up with, with this series um, by, doing, by doing it that way. Um, I yeah, yes. I think you mentioned that you wanted the form to sh uh, to express the color and pattern. Exactly. And so, right. Yes, exactly. Because it, it does such unexpected things. When I'm spinning these out, sometimes I, I, I can control the form, but sometimes little surprises happen too. And I also never know exactly what the color is going to do. You know, these, the, the, the feathering shapes in the front of this piece and, and the hues and colors, I could never have told you it was going to be this vibrant. I always hope so. 
but you know it's always kind of a surprise so having this organic form to play with the organicness of the um of the form i think it it, it just lends it they lend themselves to each other the form and the color uh, this one's at duncan's gallery as well um so you know there's different combinations of them that i do different shapes and color combinations these are, are what i call portals the uh the holes are a little bit off center, which I like. And this is actually how I started with the Aurora series. I was making these sort of seed bowl shapes with a very small opening at the top of the bowl, kind of a Native American design based on that kind of a design. And I wanted the hole to get a little bit off center. And of course I got it a little too hot and it spun out into a longer Aurora, more of a basket shape. And I was thrilled and excited and oh, okay. So now I've recently returned to this original um, uh, the original portal form and putting the cutting the windows into them too with the bellows it's much more exciting to me as a sculptural piece um, and again all of these turn around this does have a bevel uh, uh, on the other side a window um, and you can kind of see through so I blow these these end up stretching out fairly thin so sometimes you can see that transparent window um, you can see the window coming through with the light behind it um, and here's Scarlet Runner with another one of those uh, twisty components that I just love. Um, it just looks like a flower growing there, or something from a tree or, or something. <laughs> and this is just an, uh, uh, showing a demonstration of how I work with my metalsmiths and the stand work is, it takes a lot of time and I have to start with a wire form that I, I shape to this, to, specifically to each piece. Each piece comes with its very own stand because all the shapes turn out completely different. And uh, so each stand is customized. And this is just a, a shot of us welding one up, which you can't do with the glass on it. So there's a lot of back and forth. This piece is also at, at Duncan's Gallery with some of my dark copper glass on the inside. And, uh, well, and I think we end here with the Comet's Guardian with this series. That this also turns uh, and spins. So another thing that I really like to do in my work, I do do a lot of things and I ha I've had to select what I show in this, this, um, this presentation. Um, but this is, a, this is a important part of my, my work. I love collaborating. And one of my first major collaborations with, with, my, with my own partner, Janine, um, we, uh, this is us working in the shop together. Um, as I mentioned, I, I did uh, teach her how to blow glass and she has her own things that she makes, uh, but we decided to work together on some very interesting, com something completely different that I don't, I don't normally do, uh, but we have a lot of interest uh, together. And this is sort of a, it's not referencing any particular uh, culture or anything, but we, we came up with some forms that we liked and we wanted to experiment with color and texture and form and, and again, the metal work done by Caleb and these pieces hang like a gong almost. Um, we, we call these relics and this is commissioned and we would, and we do accept commissions on these pieces. We did a blue one last year um, and I didn't put the photo in. And we also make these totems. Um, these are, you know, about 60 inches tall and, and they do come apart. Um, not each component that you see does come apart. Some are attached, but like the, the onyx flame over there on the left is one, two, three, four, five pieces, then there's the base. Um, so it makes it easier to ship and move around. Uh, and there is a, a metal pole that runs up through the middle of them. So it lends stability. Um, anyway, I found these to be really fun. So then uh, that takes me to the next collaboration, uh, the Guardian series with Enrico Ambroli. Uh, Enrico, I met uh, here in Santa Fe. He was having some of his work cast in bronze next door at one of, at my, one of my tenants who does bronze finishing, Mike Massey. And we hit it off right away. And uh, he started carrying my work in his gallery that he had in Albuquerque. And we, we always had a lot of energy with our work and excited about each other's forms and shapes and stories. And so we started talking about working together. Uh, and um, night and in 2016 i think we started putting things together uh going around in, 
in each other's studios trying to see where we wanted to head with that. Um, this was our sec from our second uh, installation, it was just called Guardian Odyssey. Um, it was had a lot to do with uh, boats and journeys, water, and, but more like transformation and, and things like that. Uh, this is a sand cast boat. The gold piece is wood that's been uh, gilded in gold and it's a hot sculpted figure on top. Um, these are very exciting and here, here we are casting these boats uh, in my shop. Um, with some help. You can see in the upper left hand corner the, the sand form and we're, we're pressing in some of the textures and then we ladle the glass into it and we have to keep the surface warm while the deep inside the um, sand form gets to cool. It has to cool fairly evenly or you can have cracking problems. I also, we also did these uh, guardian uh, sort of human or statuesque forms. The masks are bronze, cast bronze. Each one is a one-off. Uh, the little birds and the people are bronze. The staff is carved wood. Um, the piece on the right, Tutore de Famiglia, that's, that one is uh, uh, available. Um, and and th these, these just are about uh, guardians of the world and animals, the weather, uh, our psyches. Uh, this uh, sky guardian uh, is here. I have a glass necklace on it. It's like a, you know, Zanferco pane that I've lamp worked into a circle for it with a bronze mask. These, this little guys uh, on the left has a fish head and a bird and they're called amigos. But the scroll form shows up a lot. It's, some, it's an element that I borrowed from some of uh, Enrico's imagery that I thought was powerful. Um, here I am uh, sculpting, hot sculpting one of our figures and uh, I'm putting the glass powder on it uh, for the color. And then I fire the color in, but if I get it really hot, it'll make it shiny. So I just fire it just enough so it sticks and it remains like a texture on, on the surface. So those pieces, that's why they have sort of a sandy looking um, texture on their surface. These are some of the masks uh, that, uh, that Enrico carves. Enrico is a, a, a bronze sculptor, a painter, a jeweler, a wood carver. Uh, he does everything and he's, he's been a teacher uh, and he is now living in Florida. And so he just moved there this uh, late fall, early, early winter, maybe it was late winter. And um, we will continue our, our collaboration, but um, right now with COVID we've had to put off moving forward into some more pieces, but here's and another piece. Yes. Elodie, where did the concept of the Guardian series come from? Um, it, it was really about, um, you know, showing uh, the Guardians are, like I mentioned before, using the certain power animals that you'll see showing up in our work, uh, the serpent, the bird, like you see here. Uh, the, for instance, and there you'll see horses, um, fish, and then the human figure and kind of our, our delicate relationship with them. The, the bird on this boat uh, represents uh, the earth and our physical uh, manifestation and the, or the serpent, I'm excusing, the serpent represents the physical manifestation. The bird represents our higher self and our tie to the heavens, um, having to do with our metaphysical identity. The golden figure, uh, again, hot sculpted, uh, encased in um, gold leaf, um, just to demonstrate the preciousness of life. And this boat represents uh, a lifting up to, to try, try to find your higher self. It's a journey to the higher self. Um, the markings on the boat, let me just say that uh, a lot of the cross hatch crosses on the boat represent souls. This is some of uh, Enrico's language integrated into the pieces. And some of the other markings are more hieroglyphic. They're like a language. Um, so, um, you know, there's just uh, this thing about this journey that, that we're all on in life. This is Il Viaggio or the voyage. Um, and these three guys are, you know, as, as if they're on a, a, a vision quest and they each have their own identities in this vision quest in, in, their, in their voyage. Um, this is a, a wall piece bird watcher. Um, Again, you know, 
an elevated image uh, of a bird. The black is glass, that is blown glass, and the, the old black oval is a mount for mounting it on the wall, and the, the mask is, is bronze, of course. Uh, the, uh, this piece has a framework. It's a horse-headed figure, a little man inside of a boat uh, in water on a journey. And um, this is uh, Guardian of Romance. The boat is full of red hearts and some gold, a few gold stars thrown in there as well. And the head and boat are all bronze. Um, so you kind of get, you get, a, you get a feeling for where we're going with this um, narrative. Uh, the bird again, elevated, hanging on the wall. Uh, it's all bronze up there and then the rest of the scroll and everything is uh, glass. Yes, Sarah, Sarah has asked, can you talk about representation and social commentary? But I know that you will yeah. uh, as we go on. And then Mary is also asking about some of the dates on the work. Uh, the, most of these pieces that we're seeing, well, but they were all made between 2017 and 2018. Um, our last show was uh, Guardian Odyssey in the, in the winter of 2018. Um, and then uh, Enrico was preparing to make his move, so we weren't able to um, move forward with any of our new work. We've got some big plans, but we put it on hold until he was done with his move. And sure. now COVID sets in, so I, because I have, I do have plans coming back east. Uh, we will send things back and forth to each other, and then and then put them all together together. So um, that's when these were were made. Um, this is Wisdom of the Sea, Lil Brun's figure again on a journey. Uh, this Wave Runner was at Duncan's Gallery and just recently sold. Um, and then this little guy, I, we have a, a, a number of these a uh, little bit smaller pieces. This one's about 13 inches high. It's a bronze horse. Again, I just love uh, Enrico's um, stylized figures and animal figures. Um, there's just so much feeling and movement and there is sort of a sacredness to them. So um, we're just highlighting those, those important things um, in our lives uh, with those kind of power animals. Uh, and here in this piece, there's three pieces that you'll see now that are based on the, um, the boat people and it, you know, that that suffer injustices or they have to leave their country for weather or violence. And um, uh, this one's called Desperate Voices. The figures are crackled and kind of, you know, downtrodden and sad. And they're, they're being uh, run by a, a two-faced oarsman. There's two faces on that mask and without an oar. So they're just suspended in time. Um, I just felt the need to do some pieces um, addressing that, um, that terrible situation that people all over the world have, not all over the world, but in the many places of the world have to go through in Cuba, Vietnam, uh, Syria, you name it, there's people are, are always being displaced from their homes and forgotten souls. You know, this again uh, is a, a boat beached on the bones of, uh, of those lost to turmoil. And this one is a, a vessel carrying lost souls that never made it to safety. But um, it's a little heavy, but um, I just felt very strongly, we felt very strongly about having to, to address that. Um, so there is more to that series, um, and I do have more photographs if anybody is interested, we can share. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with a short slides about my bee series. The bees, as I mentioned earlier, have become an important part of my life. and. Um, I was originally inspired uh, by honeycombs. When I, first time I pulled a fresh honeycomb out of the hives we were keeping, I could not believe how beautiful they were and the light coming through and the geometry of them and, and how important combs are to the hive and all the things that the bees do with them. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna make one. And here I am, I pull my own marinis, cut them up, arrange them into a, a, a pattern on a, on a, on a uh, kiln shelf and I melt them in and make a honeycomb. And I've always said, ever since I started blowing glass, that you know the consistency of hot glass is like honey. And so I made some of my amber glass and I make my own honey. 
uh, but this is frozen. It won't keep dripping off your spoon. Um, and I've, I've done these, uh, uh, a couple of these uh, constructed pieces, and I really like these series in, in, artistically. Uh, I like what I'm saying with them, but I also like being able to utilize all my techniques that I've learned over the years in glass, from flame work, uh, hot sculpting, blowing, uh, marinis, all of it just, I, it all gets thrown into these pieces and it makes it very much more interesting to me too. Worth their weight in gold, gold is a, just a piece about how important these are in our lives, and the golden pear, apple, and, and peach. Um, I flame work these blossoms of each one of those fruits uh, to have uh, in there. And this is represent the queen bee who's pregnant with a pear, which uh, she gives birth, the bees will help give birth to the, the food that we need to eat. Um, and, and just how important the, the bees are in our lives. Elodie, did you say that you were working on a much larger sculpture based on that piece that we just saw? Did I? Um, no, I, I do uh, have another honeycomb here piece that's in my window. Um, that's very similar to that, uh, that it, it's a little bit larger than that. It's about worker bees and there's little ladders and hammers and things like that on it. Um, what I mentioned before was that I've been invited to do a show, an outdoor show at the Santa Fe Botanical Gardens. Uh, it was supposed to be in 2021, in May of 2021, but um, it's been put off to 2022 because of COVID. And it will be a collaboration between myself and uh, Caleb, uh, my, metal, my metal worker. So, and I'm, so I'm designing pieces, we are designing pieces that will, will be able to go outside and they will be larger. And so maybe that's what you were thinking of. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. were thinking about a piece for the sculpture garden. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, my shop is still closed down. Um, that's why you didn't see the furnace on. But I'm hoping to reopen in September and get things going again. Uh, so I have a lot to catch up on. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to those pieces. So, I, so I'm always pushing myself, pushing my limits, and what I can do and you know, it's one thing to blow pieces by yourself and, you know, there's only a certain scale you can work in with that. But in my collaborations, I find myself, you know, doing way more. I mean, my, the ideas just never end. Um, there's no shortage, no, no writer's block or artistic blocks, you know, that, that I could never do as many a thing, a, a many pieces as I have in my head. <laughs> it, it, it just goes on and on. Um, so, and this piece, again, the queen bee pregnant with a honeycomb, um, showing the importance of bees in our lives and the pollinators. And I like to do a little bit of my own photography, but I, I just want, I just love bees. And I, I just want you all to appreciate, like I do, how beautiful these little beings are. And I love the transparency of the body, the wings, the fur. The, I, I just love everything about bees and how hard they work. Um, and they're just a joy to have in my life. Uh, these are flame worked bees that uh, are these, they look big on the screen, but they're only about two or three times the size of a normal bee. And, um, and I'll use them as, as elements in other sculptures, kind of like this. Uh, there's no time to show everything that I do. But this is a, just a little sample. Uh, again, another collaboration with Chuck Savoy, master goblet maker. Uh, he was here for one of our maestro demos a, a couple years back, and uh, we had a couple days to work together to play. And I had suggested that we make some bee goblets. So I got a thin mold that's uh, six-sided. And so we were able to make the six-sided uh, goblet cups on the top. And I made some honeycombs and bees and we put it all together. And that was really fun. Um, and that concludes my little slideshow. This is just a picture of my gallery of where the guardians live right now, some of them. Um, and, uh can you mention something about the artist who does the koi paintings that was yeah sure yes this is uh michelle holly she's uh lives here in new mexico she's worked with me for many years helped help me with some of my flame working designs i had trained her to do many 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 years ago just these little ornaments figure ornaments that i used to make and she's so talented and she's a painter uh originally and she i just love her renderings she has a koi pond and these paintings are, are, are kind of portraits of, of her pond. Um, the piece is probably uh, four feet high by three feet or a little less than three feet, something like that. Um, it's quarter inch plate glass. So the, most of the imagery is painted on the backside 
And then that is painted on the surface, but then kind of rubbed off and then highlights are put on. So it helps give that sense of depth. Um, it is on glass, but light is not meant to go through it. It's meant to be opaque like a, a pond is. When you look into the water, it's deep and dark. Um, but the, they have this etheric uh, um, feel to them and they're quite beautiful and I just love them. And I used to make uh, blow large platters uh, for her and then and sandblast them and then she would paint them and we've sold out of all of those as well. But um, yeah, she's quite talented. And we do have, uh, I do have another painting. Mm, it was probably, you would have seen it in the beginning of the slideshow going into the gallery, into the back gallery. It's more kind of aqua colors and she has a purple one and I'm happy to send pictures. Uh, They're very her. luminous and they go great with, with your work as well. They complement it. Thank you. I thought so too. And uh, yeah, in fact, um, I did, I had taken this particular painting down during the, the Odyssey show because as I mentioned before, Enrico paints and he did this beautiful painting of these boats that are about the same size. And they had all the, the boats were sort of hovering in this landscape. It was so etheric and beautiful. I, um, and then he needed them back when he moved. So I had to give them back. But I love Michelle's paintings. They do fit in quite well. So um, we have several comments. First of all, a number of people are just giving you kudos, saying what an incredible body of work, um, how beautiful, how inspiring. Um, so you should know that people are reacting uh, that oh, way. Yeah, I can't see any of that on the screen, so that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, Heidi is asking, will there be a recording of this for people who couldn't attend? And we will be publishing it on our YouTube channel, the Duncan McClellan Gallery YouTube channel, the beginning of next week uh, should be up there. Um, let's see if anyone else has a great, has any questions. Um, again, just people are very inspired. Would anyone else uh, like to make a comment? Let's see. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Steve says, um, could you describe a bit about how you decided to create your own glass and color mixtures? and what challenges there are for that. And then um, Janine says, I love that you have a different series or bodies of work that obviously utilize all your skills. So you have, um, yeah, one question and one comment there. Okay, well, yes, thank you. That is one of the things that I just, again, try to push myself. I, I come up with a concept and I'll, I'll figure out a technique that makes it happen, you know, and, and you know, I've been blowing glass, you know, a pretty long time now, or I had a little break in there, but at least I was flame working and working with glass. So overall, it was almost 40 years, I think, or thereabouts. Um, so I've, I've accumulated a few techniques in there. So I really, really enjoy the material and you can do anything with it. Um, with my color, you know, in, in, when, I was a, when I was doing ceramics, I used to uh, make my own glazes and making glass is very similar. It's a lot of the same materials, um, especially the metals that are involved. They, they do this, it's the same colors and everything. Um, when, when I worked at uh, Glory Hill Glass with Peter Vanderland, he was melting his own colors. He had two or three pots of color going at one time um, with a clear pot. And so that's what I adopted when I opened my own shop. I got used to doing that. And, um, and by being there, he would talk to me about it and teach me you know, what was going on. Um, and then I would experiment on my own. So I do have a, a small list of colors that I do melt myself, but some of my favorites being the, the Calcedoni glass, which is a very peculiar glass. Most, most uh, glass artists will complain about it because it never shows up as vibrant as they would like it to be. And all I can say is you just have to keep practicing with it. And it's about the heating and cooling. And it also happens that I can't get I can only get those vibrant colors by drawing out of the furnace last. It is the final gather on my pieces. So the color is on the surface rather in, than encased in the clear. And that allows uh, interaction between the gas atmosphere or the reduction atmosphere of the reheat furnace um, and, the, and the colors. So that's, that's part of what's happening too. When you case it, um, sometimes the colors get a little more pastel-y, sometimes they are vibrant, 
but it depends on how hot you have to get the piece while you're working with it. So there's a lot of tricky stuff going on. Um, you know, a few years back in 2010, I had to have an ankle uh, fusion and I'm, I had to have, I had to keep working. So I had people assisting me and when they would gather it, I would have to be there. Okay, let it cool down more, cool it more, more. Okay, heat it up more, less. No, come out now. And it was, it was so hard because some of it is by feel. I can feel how hot the glass is and know what temperature it's at and, and, and visually too. So it's a combination of all that. That was quite an experience. Um, but so it's a, for me, it's, um, I'm just sort of addicted to that color and I do a lot of different things with it. Um, but I do love my Aurora Sculpture Series. I think it's, it's pretty exciting and, and, I, and I like working in collaboration with my metalsmith on those. Well, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Joni. Uh, if you weren't an, ama an amazing artist, what else would you have done? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you know, when I graduated high school, I, t I did a lot of music in, and art. Um, hey, Joni. Joni's a musician. Joni is? Oh, okay, great. Um, you know, I played guitar and I sang and I was in choir and all that stuff. So when I went to college, I, I felt like I couldn't do both art and music in, in terms of studying. So I figured I finally, it was a really hard decision because I had a love for both. Um, but I figured I could always just sling my guitar around with me wherever I go and, and I could study art and, and really focus on finding my voice and learning techniques that would help me express that. Um, so I may have been a musician. <laughs> um, and and so that that's one of the things but art has always been a part of my life so I don't know and Janine and I we talk about retiring what would retirement look like and we blow glass part-time we'd hit the road in our little camper and go fly fishing and get sponsorships and tell stories about our fishing trips and tell lies and you know <laughs> and, beer and things like that so there's never a dull moment in my life there's many different choices i i brew beer too we all we brew beer we have a little beer group so maybe i could open up a little pub i don't know <laughs> um bradley asks who photographs your work that it's beautifully photographed well thank you uh wendy mccarran she does my professional photography she's here in town in santa fe she does a lot of museum work and magazine work here. And I've known her since um, the 80s. Uh, she learned to photograph glass on my work. Then she started taking on Pete Robeson's work and, and Charlie Miner's work. And she learned a lot about how to photograph glass. Um, and I've learned a lot from her. So some of the photographs peppered in there are even my studio shots. I, I, I do my best uh, mm -hmm. and but you know, Wendy, you can't beat her. So yes, thank you. She, she deserves big kudos for the work she does. She's awesome. Uh, I do want to thank LED for doing this today as uh, amazing body of work. I can't wait to have you in our studio that will come up and uh, you'll have to bring Enrico and maybe collaborate out of our uh, facility. Fantastic. But it was great to see you. Love it. Well, you know, when all this other stuff passes, we will be there because we we will continue working on some things until we can get to to together. So we'll just mail stuff back and forth, and yeah, that would be great. Thank you. So everyone, stay tuned uh, for Elodie coming to St. Petersburg. Yay! Oh, that would be so much fun. And I love the beach, as you saw in some of my pictures. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Duncan and Mary, Danielle, Irene. You guys are incredible and awesome, and I really look forward to being there. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. This was a wonderful presentation. Uh, Elodie, I know that you put so much work into this, and we're very, very appreciative. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, next week, we will be hosting Elizabeth Sterling from Seattle. So please join us for that session as well. Great. And Elodie, can't wait to see you. Uh, thank you for partnering with the gallery and providing us with such beautiful work and such wonderful energy. Oh, thank, thank you very much to, to all of you. It was a pleasure. <laughs>